Yeah, thank you. We move to our next lecture, uh, which will be given by Yaga Richter. Yaga is a scientist in the Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory at NCAR. Yaga is also a member of our scientific organizing committee for this um, ASP colloquium. Yaga graduated from the University of Washington, um, studying gravity waves and um, their impacts on the climate system. Yaga has um, since uh, been at NCAR, she joined NCAR um, as an ASP postdoctoral fellow and has spent majority of her scientific career at NCAR with a brief um, stint as an education and outreach fellow at the University of Colorado. Yaga co-leads the Earth System Prediction Working Group for the CESM um, modeling system. And Yaga's expertise and scientific interests include gravity waves and their parameterizations in global climate models, middle atmospheric dynamics, QBO, whole atmosphere climate modeling, uh, S2S forecasting, and geoengineering. Um, Yaga was, has developed the first source of spectrum parameterization of convectively generated gravity waves in the climate model and has contributed to development both in the NCAR community atmosphere model as well as is contributing to the DOE's Earth system model currently. Thank you, Yaga, for um, accepting our invitation to give a lecture. Thank you for having me, Anish, and thanks, Amy, for giving a great introduction to the stratosphere. I will try not to repeat anything that Amy has said um, but I'll focus on the QBO, the quasi-biennial oscillation, and then also focus on the experiments with NCARS model that we've done to try to address the role of the stratosphere in S2S prediction. But yes, I have one introductory slide, a little summarizing what uh, Amy talked about. So Amy focused on the stratospheric polar vortex, and I will spend a, the introduction talking to you about the QBO, which is the quasi-biennial oscillation. And this is an oscillation that's most visible in the stratospheric zonal mean wind. So what I have here on the right is just a time series from observations. And you see these alternating easterly and westerly winds uh, in the tropics. And you see that this oscillation is pretty regular. What it means, for, well, and regular means also that it's very predictable. And the period of the QBO ranges from about 24 to 32 months. So it's not exactly 28 months all of the time, but as you'll see later, the predictability of this oscillation is very good compared to other uh, features in the stratosphere, for example, like sudden warmings, which can only be predicted about two weeks ahead of time. So um, why do we care about the QBO? And it's because it has teleconnections to the troposphere. It also has impacts on the stratosphere, but for the purpose of this talk, I'll focus on how it affects the troposphere. And there are three routes of this. And this is a nice summary figure from Gray et al. 2018. So first there is the polar route. So when you have alternating easterly and westerly winds in a stratosphere, they change the propagation of planetary scale waves into this polar vortex. And by the what we call the Holton Tan mechanism is when we have a stronger polar vortex, it happens to be mostly in QBO West. And QBO by QBO West, we mean that either at 30 or 50 hectopascal, the winds are westerly. And when the winds are easterly at this altitude, so that would be around here, so 30 to 50 hectopascal, the polar vortex tends to be easterly. And by if you followed Amy, that would have implications for the predictability of the NAO. Then there is also a tropical route. So when there is a strong oscillation and winds in the lower stratosphere, this is associated with changes in temperature. And there's also an induced meridional circulation. And what we believe is that these changes in temperature near the tropopause, they affect the MJO and they affect the deep convection. And then there's the subtropical route. Uh, so again, when we're changing uh, the meridional circulation, we'll change the medium from by which the planetary scale waves uh, are propagating through, and then we can affect the subtropical, subtropical jet. So I'll talk about a little bit about the, what we know about the QBO NAO connection. And most of this evidence has been on seasonal timescales. And again, the QBO is very well predicted. 
So uh, the red line here shows you analysis over a few years. And the blue line shows you the model prediction of the QBO from the UK Met Office system. And you see this is quite good uh, of a prediction of the QBO. So more or less, they're getting the right phase of the QBO. And there are some composites on the right here of DJFC level pressure. So on the left here, we have the forecast. And, Q and on the right, we have the observations. And what you particularly see is this area of high sea level pressure just west of Europe here. And this is captured in the forecast. However, the amplitude of this pattern is much weaker than observed. And here is another picture from another study by Scaife et al. 2014. Again, we're looking at anomalies of sea level pressure. And on the left here is observational analysis showing this negative NAO pattern. And the seasonal prediction system does show a similar pattern. However, it's much weaker in amplitude. But uh, a lot of the UK Met Office studies have really highlighted that for seasonal prediction, the QBO has shown quite the influence at the surface. Now for the Q QBO MJO, uh, the story has been a little bit more complicated. So in observations, there is a very strong relationship between the QBO and MGO. So if we correlate, uh, well, let me start here. So what I'm showing here in this top panel is the standard deviation of the MGO filtered OLR anomalies for all winters and focusing on DGF. And if you pick out West QBO winters, so again, winters for which 50 hectopascal winds are westerly, so you're just picking those years out. It turns out that the MJO is far less active. And for easterly QBO winters, the MJO is more active. And what these observational studies have found that MJO convection is stronger and more organized and propagates most slowly during easterly QBO. And this is one of the things we don't fully understand, but the hypothesis is that the influence from the QBO comes via the temperature perturbations near the tropopause in the upper troposphere. So here is another pick, uh, here's another QBO MGO relationship, this one in S2S studies. And this is by Abik and Hendon and based on two Australian models, Axis S1 and Puama 2. And what they, they do find enhanced predictability of the MGO under QBO East conditions. So in particular, you can see this in these right panels here for strong MJO events that under QBO East, the predictability of the MJO is out to 31 days, for example, for the AXIS model and out to 30 days for the Palma 2 model. And it's only at 10 days for QBO West in this model and only 21 days in the AXIS model. So in this modeling system, there is quite a robust relationship in terms of enhanced predictability. However, from the same study, if you look at their comparison of RMM percent amplitude difference between QBO East and QBO West in observations versus the models, you see that the amplitudes are underestimated. So the red lines here are the model and the gray lines are observations. So the relationship is sort of there in their model, but it's much weaker than what we see in observations. And Hayami Kim also took a look at this in other S2S models. And what she's looking at the relationship, again, of East QBO and West QBO on the RMM scale of the MJO. Um, and in the top here, this is averages over the whole entire season from October through March. And bottom is only for DJF. For some of these are US subseasonal models, and there is also ECMWF. And the first thing you see is that if you look at the entire season from October to March, um, the relationship is not even the same as in DJF. So, for example, for ECMWF, it seems that for RM scale of 0.5, then you get greater uh, skill in East QBO compared to West QBO, but it's opposite if you look at the entire season. And uh, for some models, there is a significant relationship. So these green, green triangles indicate statistical significance. And you do see that 
West QBO gives you a little bit higher skill than East QBO. However, this relationship in that model is not significant in GGF. So again, the message is that there is a relationship, but it's mostly insignificant or somehow not the same as what we see in observations. Okay, so I'm gonna move on uh, to NCAR models and the stratosphere and how we've addressed some of these questions, trying to find out what is the role of the stratosphere. And NCAR is a primarily research organization. So we really focus on understanding the sources of predictability. And the main question we ask is how much improvement in S2S prediction can be gained from including a well-resolved stratosphere. And the NCAR S2S systems are based on our Earth system model used for climate prediction. So this model was not developed for S2S. It was developed for long time scale simulations. So the simulations that uh, basically fuel the IPCC projections. And between 2016 and 2020, we're looking at S2S with CSM1, which is the Community Earth System Model version one that was developed for the AR5 uh, part of CIMIP. And since 2020, we're using CSM2 and CSM2 with the whole atmosphere model as the atmosphere component. I'll explain it in a little bit. And those, that's the model that's being used for the for AR6. Okay, um, so let's start with CSM1 and what we've done to isolate the role of the stratosphere. So our system includes the atmosphere and interactive land, ocean, and sea ice. And our basic CIMIP type model is a 30 layer model which has a very poor representation of the stratosphere. So our top is about two hectopascal and there's very few levels in the stratosphere. And that configuration does not have a QBO and it has a relatively poor representation of sudden stratospheric warmings. So the tropical winds are uh, always easterly. And then we developed a model that's 50% more expensive and keep that in mind because it has 46 vertical levels However, if we actually resolve the stratosphere and now we can have uh, a QBO, it's not perfect. If you compare to observations, there are deficiencies. It doesn't quite go down to 100 hectopascal. But if you compare to what the low top model has, it is significantly improved. And I'm not showing this, but this model also has a much better climatology of sudden stratospheric warmings. And we know from Amy's work that that is really important for that coupling to the troposphere. So my expectation was that this model will outperform this basic model for subseasonal prediction. And we've reran the entire SubX protocol exactly with both systems. So we just follow the SubX protocol, hindcast from 1999 to 2015, 10 ensemble members with both systems, 45 day runs. We initialize from era interim and we also initialize land and ocean. And because there is nothing different in these models in the troposphere, it's really an apples for apples comparison. You can't say that the model physics was different and that's why you're having skill. They're really the only difference between these is in this, in this stratosphere. So when we first look at stratospheric prediction between these systems, and as expected, for example, for the QBO, the 46 level model does a lot better and especially it does a lot better during the West QBO West phase because it doesn't capture it at all. However, note that the scale on these, the correlation uh, between observations is still very high. So uh, even at the end of the forecast period, the low top model still has a correlation scale of about 0.87, uh, which is really quite good. And similarly for the polar vortex, so we look at the nominal correlation coefficient of the 10 hectopascal winds at 60 north. And as expected, the higher top model with a better stratosphere, it predicts the polar vortex better and the 30 level model a little worse. And I didn't put the figure, but there was no notable difference in prediction of SSWs and mainly because SSWs are rare. So in this 20 year record, I think there's only 11 events our hindcasts were always started on Wednesday. So it's also hard to get a clear picture because we're not starting the exact, uh, the same amount of days before each sudden warming. But nevertheless, we didn't, from the statistics that we had, we didn't really note uh, a different skill in prediction of sudden warmings between these two systems. Okay, so we have better stratospheric predictability. How much uh, difference does it make to surface prediction? 
The answer sadly is very little. <laughs> so the good news is that the performance of our model is very good. So what I'm showing is here is surface temperature for different seasons. So DJF, uh, GJA, et cetera. These are the two NCAR systems. And I'm comparing that to other SubX models. Here is the NOAA CFS V2, there's FIM, GS, and other models. So what you see is that overall predictive prediction skill of the NCAR models is quite high, which indicates that we are doing something right, that it's a good modeling system for S2S. But if you compare the bars for the 30 level model and the 46 level model, there is very small differences between them and they're not statistically significant. So the overall prediction skill from the system that has 50% more cost, because that's what we're paying for the stratosphere, is not translating to an improvement at the surface. And here's another skill score diagram. Um, there is the 46 level model, 30 level model. And what these bars are showing is the percent chance a model will have a more skillful forecast than CFS V2 based on the Breyer skill score. And yeah, there is a slightly better skill from the 46 level model. But again, it's there when we do any statistical analysis, it doesn't show up as um, anything better. What we do find is that if you actually combine all the models and use the skill from all the modeling system that you do get a much better forecast. So if you include the information from all of the models that uh, you have a 78% chance of being more skillful than just using one single modeling system in particular here, the CFS V2. And you may say, well, what about the NAO and what about the NJO? Because those are the two likely things that are to be affected by the stratosphere. And again, in our study, we did not find any significant difference. So the 30 level and the 46 level model have the exact same NAO predictability and the same MJO predictability. So that was a little bit disappointing, but I think that is the part of research. And it doesn't mean that the stratosphere is not important. And I will come back to it in a little bit why I think we're not seeing this difference at the surface. And again, it's not because the stratosphere, it's not important. So let me then move on to talking about CSM2 and CSM2 Wacom. So we did a similar study with our latest model. And again, CSM2 is just this low top model. We have now 32 levels, but it has the lid in the same place at about two hectopascals. It has no interactive chemistry. Um, so it's a very fast model compared to the CSM2 Wacom. Wacom stands for the whole atmosphere community climate model. And this is the most complicated model that I think is being ran for S2S prediction. It has a top at 140 kilometers. It includes parameterizations of non-orographic gravity waves. In addition, it has fully interactive tropospheric and stratospheric chemistry. And this is where a lot of the cost of the model is. So the computational cost of this model is eight times the cost of CSM2. So not only 50% more expensive, this is eight times. And it's part of the reason we can only run the hindcast from October to March, and we can only write, uh, run five ensemble members because just the cost is prohibitive. And we looked again, what is the skill of this model compared to our low top model and compared to the previous versions of the model? Uh, and in parentheses here, you see the number of ensemble members that we compare because with Wacom, we're only able to run five members. But we know that if we run 10 members, we should get higher skills. So for example, the green bars are for CSM1 and you see that the, with 10 members, you get a little higher skill than with five members. So if you look at all the bars that include five members, so pink, blue, and this light green, for any week for surface temperature, you see that the skill is very similar. And same for precipitation on the bottom right here. There are small differences, but none of them are statistically significant. So more or less, all of these systems are giving you the same surface prediction skill. Um, here is a more detailed view of that for DJF two meter temperature, just so you see if there is any regional differences. And in particular, in weeks three and four, um, between Wacom and CSM2, there is virtually no difference. And this is partly interesting to us because I didn't mention our Wacom system and see the low top system are not started the same way. 
One of them is started from CFS2. The other one is starting from MERA2 analysis that we nudge to, and they also have different ocean initializations. So in addition about the role of the stratosphere, it's also taught us that how exactly we initialize the atmosphere and the ocean is also really not making much difference for week three, four prediction, at least for surface temperature. Uh, the weeks five, six, you see a little bit more difference. Uh, these are the areas shown here are the ones that are statistically significant, but at this time it's difficult to pin these down to any particular aspect of the model, for example, because there are so many differences, but these differences are rather small, which indicates that there's just some inherent things in the predictability from the initial conditions that are really driving that and the details, whether we use CFSV2, MERA nudging, etc., they're making much smaller difference. And again, here's the NAO and the MJO. And there are a little bit more differences in the o, NAO for our uh, Wacom system. So with five ensemble members, there is higher skill than for the other modeling systems. Uh, however, due to the small number of years, so Heincast over 20 years, these numbers are not showing up to be significant. So more or less, we're finding that the, we have really good NAO skills so up to weeks three, four, all of the systems are almost at ACC of 0.5, but they're more or less just uh, have the same predictability and the same thing for the MJO. There's very little difference between these model versions. All right, so now the question you're wondering, why is there so little impact from the stratosphere or at least from better resolving stratosphere is maybe the better way to phrase the question. And one thing is that global models don't capture teleconnections very well. So we're utilizing here a global model that's used for climate projections. And this is a study by NC et al. on teleconnections of the QBO to the NAO, uh, utilizing a whole bunch of different models with actually good QBOs. And what you see here, this thick line here is the observed correlation. And these individual bars you see are the correlations of the QBO to the NIO from other models. And you see only one model even reaches the observed correlation and the other models even have the opposite sign. So the models are bad at capturing this relationship. They are even worse at capturing the connection of the QBO to the MJO. Here's another study by Kim et al. And similarly here, the observed QBO the observed QBO east minus QBO west line is here. So this is where observations are falling. This is every circle here is an ensemble member of these models here. So for example, ECM E3SM 1.0, there's only five members. But what you see that the correlation in these models does not even come close to what we see in observations. So most of the CIMIP type models, the global models, are simply not capturing the QBO to the MJO teleconnection. And it's difficult to expect that they will actually capture this really well when you run it as a subseasonal to seasonal prediction model. And here is the other reason. I think largely we're not seeing these huge differences on subseasonal time scale. Is the stratospheric initial conditions, they basically hold onto their uh, initial state. So for example, if you look at the zonal mean wind between 10 south to 10 north in observations, and in the 46 level model, and in the 30 level model over this forecast period, you see, yes, that the low top model degrades a lot uh, more than the 46 level model. However, more or less the phase of the QBO is kept and you're probably getting a bulk of the effect. Now, if you've taken this out to a seasonal time scale, I don't think there would be the same situation. You can see that the, uh, especially if you were in a QBO uh, West phase, that the sturdy level model will have really poor predictability as you get out to a few months because it's rapidly declining. But if you initialize a model with a poor stratosphere with a particular phase of the QBO, it actually holds onto it fairly well through this short uh, subseasonal time scale. And here is a figure from Limital 2019. She's showing QBO correlation at one month. And you see some of the models which have good QBOs, for example, UKMO, the correlation there is 1.0, which is super high. And the model with the worst stratosphere, uh, BOM, still has a pretty high correlation of 0.85. So I think the message is that on the subseasonal time scale, if you initialize a model even with a poor stratosphere, it's gonna hold on to that initial condition. And that's why we're not seeing these drastic results. 
So, so that doesn't mean that uh, stratosphere is not important. It actually is. And so in this study led by Lan Tao Sun from CSU, we combined our CSM1 ensembles with the 30 level and the 46 level model to just to create a 20 member ensemble. And then we looked at NAO predictability from different uh, stratospheric vortex states. So here's the initial zonal mean wind at 10 hectopascal 60 north. And you see the vortex is highly variable and we separate it into strong vortex states, weak vortex states and states where the vortex was neutral. And now you're starting to see how the stratosphere matters. So especially in week five and week six, there is much better predictability from weak and strong vertex events as compared to the neutral vertex events. However, there is no difference between a low top and a high top model because they both seem to represent that similarly. All right, so research always brings surprises. And if I have time, I'm gonna give you one more example of this. Um, so Amy mentioned a lot about sudden warmings and she showed you how they cause surface anomalies about one month after. So you have this cooling pattern over Eurasia and warming pattern over Northeastern United States. And we just happened to have a recent sun and stratosphere warming on January 5th, 2021. We were super excited about it because we were running our CSM to Wacom system in real time. So we could actually make a forecast and see how it verified. And here is the CPC verification. So about for weeks before after the event. And you see a pattern very similar to what's in Amy's plot over here. So you see a lot of cooling over uh, Eurasia and a little bit warming here on the Eastern United States. Uh, so we were excited to see how Wacom did for this event. And it was actually one of the two models who did really great. So this is the, um, R, you have R squares, so the correlation coefficient square against the CPC verification. And out of all the sub-X models, ECC, GEM, and the NCAR system seem to perform really well. So they're both showing this cooling over Eurasia. And uh, here you have warming over Labrador C. This is what you were saying. So we said, oh my gosh, this is great. We're finally seeing an impact of sudden stratospheric warming. And this must be from the sudden stratospheric warming, right? The pattern is almost exactly the same. Uh, however, we took our research system and decided then to take out the sudden warming. How did we do that? Well, because to start our model, we nudged the stratosphere to MERA uh, reanalysis. We just backed out for two weeks and we nudged, the, we stopped nudging the stratosphere to observations, but just let it go to climatology. But we nudged the stratosphere perfectly. So basically we scrambled the stratosphere and we kept the realistic troposphere. So in these simulations, there was no sudden stratospheric warmings. We also scrambled the troposphere and did other configurations, but I'll focus on this case. So here's the regular forecast. And the bottom panel is we scrambled the stratosphere so there's no sudden warming. There is only, we kept the, the initial state from the troposphere only. And you see that the correlation between these is very high. And the correlation between this scrambled stratospheric forecast is also very close to the observations. So our study shown for week three, four, and we didn't look closely for week one, two, and the weeks beyond, it actually showed that if the warming didn't happen, then we also would predict the same surface pattern. So perhaps the stratosphere, so the stratosphere contributed a little, but not a whole lot as much as we thought to this pattern. So this brings me to the last slide that uh, we've developed this uh, S2S system with CSM2 to enable the wider community to do these experiments and to do other similar experiments to really get at the sources of predictability. So since April 2020, we have the Earth System Prediction Working Group within CSM. And again, the goal is just to advance fundamental understanding of these sources of predictability. And CSM is a community model, so you're welcome to download it. We still don't have the initial conditions available for larger use, but if you ask, we can get them to you. And we already have just basic hindcast sets. We also have SMILE, which is a seasonal to multi-year large ensemble that Steve Yeager has been leading. That is two-year predictions and there are four starts per year. So we can look at the longer time scales. 
And there's also Smile X in production, which is extending those forecasts to 10 years just from the November start dates. So I'll end here and take any questions you might have. Thank you, Yaga. That's a really comprehensive um, overview of influence of QB or maybe the lack of influence of the stratosphere on short time scale.